Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you are doing well. Sorry, I was just adding a video at the very last minute there, and I just wanted to make sure I got it in there, so I was a little late getting started. I can hear myself. That's a good sign. So technology is working. Yay, that always makes me happy. All right. Well, um, I'm back from some travels. And so once again, our topic today is inspired by some of the things I saw on the road. So I hope you will join me in our discussion today. We're going to talk about um, kind of opting in to participate in a training session. We've, we've had a little bit of discussion on this before, but I think we're going to talk a little Little bit more about the practicality of it all sort of the practical application aspects of it all so this is a good one especially if you are somebody that's maybe involved in educational programming or maybe you work with animals in therapy programs you know how do you how do you know if the animal wants to participate or not and um, and it's more about the configuration sort of um, you know what are your different setups look like and we had some really cool discussions about that on a recent consultation all right so if you are new what do we do doing this is you be the behavior consultant the live stream i try to do most mondays except for when i'm out of town or something else has come up uh, and how it works i present a topic for discussion um, i've got a few questions to prompt discussion because i want i want to hear your experiences this, this isn't just a lecture this is really more interactive and we then explore the topic with videos i actually have quite a few videos to share this time so hopefully we'll look at those to really prompt our discussion and then we'll recap it all at the end and and um, certainly uh, let me know if you can't hear me or anything or can't see things. For some reason, I'm feeling less confident about my tech skills today. It feels like I've been away for a while. I don't know what's up. All right. So we're going to talk about that. You know, I, I always, I'm so hesitant to use the word choose because, you know, those of you that know your um, behavior analysis, behavior is selected by the environment. So it's not so much that the animals quote, Oh, good. So far, so good on the tech side. Thanks, Lindsay. I needed that. You know, you know, again, going back to how behavior, you know, occurs or is admitted, it's more that the environment selects the behavior than the animal, quote, is choosing. So, you know, we're kind of, you know, slipping back and forth between our layman terminology and what really happens in the science. But I'm going to say choosing to participate arrangements just because maybe that is helpful for people. Um, but we're trying to figure out how do we create a situation where the animal can allocate behavior in a way that says, all right, I'm, I'm into this. I want to do this thing. <laughs> Monday fun day, says Ann. Yay, <laughs> we're back. So I guess what I'm trying to figure out is what are some configurations that maybe people have tried um, that give the animal to way, uh, an animal to way, a way to say, yeah, I'm into this or no, I'm not into this. And, um, uh, and have you trained any behaviors that you use to test that? And maybe also asking the question, what happens if the animal says, eh, I'm not doing that. I don't want to do that. You know, what's the consequence for not doing that behavior? Or, and it could be um, a group of behaviors. Maybe it's more than one behavior that you've trained that gives you information. And, um, and uh, I know I'm being a little vague here <laughs> with some of my questions, but it's because I don't want to lead you down any specific pathway. I want people to kind of share some of the things they've, they've done because what I started realizing as I started exploring this is that, boy, there's a lot of configurations. Um, okay, so Lindy, Lindsay says, for red pandas, um, I work with, uh, work with, they typically first come to a station to participate in a training session. If they don't, then we don't necessarily pursue. Yeah, so that was one of the things that we definitely saw at um, the facility where I just was, that a lot of animals sort of had like um, what they were calling like a yes station. If they came to their yes station, that was sort of the, okay, now we're going to move forward. Um, and But then there's also like sort of what happens next too, which was interesting to discuss. The red pandas can also tell me they want to engage with me through eye contact that I have reinforced over time. Ah, so there's actually more than one behavior that has reinforcement history that says, are we going to proceed or not? Mm, and I like that. And that was particularly relevant um, for this team as well, because they were also, you know, evaluating body language things. Um, so I like that as well, because they also have some small animals there that are 
are part of education programs that they would like maybe some of them to load themselves into containers, but some of them, they might involve some handling. And so some of it might be like you're saying, you know, an, a certain body position or eye contact that says, okay, yes, I want to go like, I, I, you know, not to give away too much, here, <laughs> but one of their specific ones was like looking at a turtle um, that is it all pulled into the shell or is it coming out of the shell? You know, that was something that they were looking at as giving information as, are you into this or are you not into this? Um, so I like that um, example of what does the, you know, the eye contact tell you? Yeah, so the, I like those, that example. Yeah, anybody, well, Lindsay, you can give, you can share more examples, but if anybody else has some examples they wanna share, that's helpful as well. Um, yeah, so there's, so like I was saying, what, what we discovered as we started exploring these questions is that different animals had different configurations. It wasn't really the same for every situ every single situation. Um, and I think what was really interesting is, is um, you know, part of it was about natural history of species. Um, for, a stri for a striped skunk, <laughs> I can't even talk, to be picked up, he had to hunker. If he moved, I wouldn't pick him up. Mm. To do an encounter, he had to kennel. If he didn't kennel, that might tell me he wasn't motivated that day for it. Ah, okay. So, so um, he has reinforcement history with kenneling. So that's a behavior that he knows if he does kenneling, it's going to lead to reinforcement, might lead to some other things. That That's another thing to um, um, ask about. And also you're looking at some body language that says, okay, if he does this specific body language, that's going to lead to being picked up, which again may lead to some other things. Um, but I really wanted him, I really wanted to work on having a way to tell him what activity we were going to do, walk versus kennel versus explore another area, etc. Yeah, so that takes reinforcement history, right? Um, and and, uh, and so that might mean um, offering some specific stimulus that the animal may engage, you know, maybe it's like, you know, you go to this target and that means we're going to go for a walk or you go into the kennel and that means we're going to go to this particular area. Or if you go, um, I'm going to present, you know, this station and that station means we're going to go explore this particular area. So each one of those leads to some different kind of reinforcing activity. Yeah. Um, versus encounter, not kennel, I mean. Uh, okay, gotcha. All right. I wanted to do signals or a different cloth or something of that sort. Yeah, so you wanted, you wanted to teach, give the animal reinforcement history that these different um, SDs, you do this specific behavior um, that, that uh, lets me know that you want to go have this experience or participate in this experience. Yep, I like that a lot. Yeah, and you you basically would present those different options, and then the animal would have the option to allocate behavior to one of those options, and that would lead to one of those experiences. And it's basically opting opting in, having to select having the option option to select between those options. I like that, or none of them, right? Or say or none of them. Yeah, I never got that far, but maybe future me. <laughs> I like that. I love that um, configuration. Yeah, so that choosing to participate arrangement. So yeah, that I think that's a great, a great um, uh, arrangement, and and uh, and definitely one that I think would be really cool to work towards for a lot of facilities and a lot of different animals. And you're right; it takes building that reinforcement history on each of those so that the animal understands um, that that would be an option. Yeah, cool. I use simple stationing. If my bird or horse go to their station without being cued, I know they want to want to do some fun stuff. So the station's available in the environment and the animal can just voluntarily go to that station on their own and that's giving you information that they're they're um, interested in participating in something. And it doesn't necessarily lead to some um, specific behavior. It might be something whatever you know they have a whole repertoire of things that you may do it may be training a new behavior it may be running through some behaviors that they already know um, 
So it could, so they don't know what it leads to, but it leads to something. I like that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, you guys are good. You're coming up. You're, you're definitely coming up with things that I have on my list here. So this is, I like this. I like, oh, but this is making me very happy. <laughs> These are the things that, that we were discovering as well, because I think sometimes, um, you know, there's sort of this, I don't know, I think maybe a vision that there's only one way that an animal gets to say yes, yes to something. But as we start discussing it, it turns out there's, there's lots of, lots of different ways or yes or no. <laughs> so I like this. This is great. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, maybe, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, um, I'll pull up some things here. So, um, so some of these are, are, uh, on this page and then I've got another page with some examples. So it might be emitting a specific, um, a specific single behavior or body language, which you guys mentioned here. And, it, and again, I'm in this example, I'm kind of thinking about animals that might be participating in education programs. Um, it might be that they get picked up and placed in a transport container based on doing that behavior. They might be transported to another location, which may lead to reinforcing activities. And it might, and doing that specific behavior or presenting that or emitting that body language might lead to opportunities to admit other behaviors, um, which leads to reinforcement, which uh, I think was the example Chris gave there. And, um, and then sometimes emitting a, um, a specific single behavior might lead to a behavior sequence and reinforcement. And I think that's kind of that start button example that we've had conversations about before. And so I'm going to give you a slide that's looks very, very complicated, but um, don't let it scare you. <laughs> but here are like a lot of configurations that that kind of came up in our discussions. So it could be that um, so maybe, you know, you uh, the animal just doesn't emit any trained behavior and it just gets left alone. And so there's basically nothing really happens if the animal you know, doesn't do anything at all. Um, and then there could be the animal does not admit the trained behavior, but there's still like reinforcing consequences, so to speak, available in the, in the environment where the animal has, you know, stayed away, you know, has not participated. So meaning that, you know, the same, like maybe, maybe you were asking it to participate and it was going to get some sort of food item. Um, but that same f food item is available in the environment. So it's kind of saying, yeah, I, you know, good stuff is available here. Good stuff's available there. But, you know, either way, this is this this is what the options are. Um, and then another configuration that we've seen is that it does not emit that trained behavior that says, you know, I might come and participate. But that same free reinforcing consequence will be available later. For example, the diet is fed later. And so the example that I tend to think about is if it's an animal that doesn't maybe forage all day um, and so it doesn't have access to the diet all day and so people tend to feed the diet in portions or maybe um, at one time and so we see that with species certain species of birds certain um, reptile species so you might see that configuration um, we talked about this it emits it emits a trained behavior and it leads to a specific behavior sequence uh, it emits the a trained behavior and it leads to several different possible outcomes. And so this is kind of where we were talking about. So one behavior might lead to, I get to do many different other things. Um, but then you could have that, maybe the animal's trained to do two different behavior options that result in the same reinforcing consequence. And then the, the stimulus for a behavior to participate is is presented and maybe there's a stimulus that says I don't want to participate and those are both presented at the same time and then the animal can allocate behavior to whichever stimulus it it, it decides and then um, and then also you know the option to do absolutely nothing neither one of those is available and so we'll see which way the animal allocates behavior and then this is I think what Lindsay was um, uh, well, I don't know if it's the same one. Lindsay may have presented seven or eight. We'll see. Um, option seven or eight. 
we, then we can have a situation where we have several behaviors that are trained that result in the same reinforcing consequence. And so all stimuli are available at the same time and the al animal can al allocate behavior to whichever option it, it decides, right? And then number eight could be there are several behaviors that, that are trained that result in different in different reinforcing consequences. So maybe we have, and so maybe now we've got the, the, the stimuli available all at the same time and the al animal can allocate behavior to whichever one it wants, but the, the reinforcing consequence is different. So on seven, the reinforcing consequence is the same, but on eight, the reinforce, reinforcing consequence is different. So we've got several options on number seven, and we got several options on number eight, and the animal kind of tells us which one it wants, but on seven, the consequences are the same, and on eight, the consequences are different. So, so these are like all the different possible things that, that you know, and there could be more, <laughs> but these were some that we started, um, we started realizing were out there. And then some things to think about that may impact where behavior might be allocated is what might be the critical consequence. So um, is, is the animal most interested in food? Is water important? Um, is it temperature? Maybe, you know, the animal's trying to, you know, gain access to heat, ex escape, um, you know, cold or, or escape heat. Um, maybe the animal wants distance as a re um, reinforcer. Maybe access to companionship or attention is, reinforce is reinforcing. So in that moment, you would have to see what is the most important thing to the animal at that moment. And then we have to recognize that critical consequences are changing from moment to moment as conditions change. So as time passes, and um, maybe the, the critical consequence becomes something else. Maybe the animal starts to satiate um, if you're offering food, and so food doesn't become so important, and maybe the animal's thinking, well, I'd rather hang out with my buddies, or maybe I'd rather go hang out in a little hidey spot. Um, maybe the weather changes, and so now um, getting out of the sun is more important for an animal that likes to bask. Maybe it's getting too warm, and it needs to go find shelter. So the critical consequence could change. And then remember that critical consequences can be potentiated by changes in conditions. And so we know that, you know, people, um, you know, if you withhold breakfast from an animal, then suddenly food becomes more important. And, um, and so things like that can be manipulated. And then our ever important nonlinear contingency analysis, there may be other contingencies that might be impacting desired responses. So are there other reinforcers that are impacting how behavior is allocated? And are there punishers that are de decreasing participation? So could there be competition between other animals in that space? Could there be other things about where the animal is allocating behavior that are reinforcing besides what you, you know the critical consequence so all those things may be impacting what the animal is is going to do so now that you've got all those crazy things in mind let's look at some videos <laughs> all right so first um i've got i've got one that's um a, you know relatively simple i think um i have the audio down so we've got this armadillo and probably going to load in this crate, right? And so yeah, that's pretty awesome, loading in the crate voluntarily. But there's a lot we can think about, right? When we, when we think about um, some of the things that were on our other slides there. So, so what do you guys think? I love that this armadillo goes in the crate on its own. But what are some things that come to mind for you as you watch that? I would be curious about putting the crate in a different location. And, um, and maybe you can elaborate on that, Lindsay. What are you thinking um, in terms of that?
and I can I and I'll show you another video too that may um also get your wheels turning. It's sort of placed in a direct path. They could go back or back or around if they do not want to go in. Also, is there reinforcement inside the crate already? Yeah, so that's a good question. You know, um, so what is reinforcing about the crate in this situation? Yeah, so so maybe her options were a little bit limited. That could be the case. Um, but I would be interested in putting it a bit further so they are really choosing. Yeah, so maybe um, maybe if it was in a different spot um, so she has a little bit more space. Um, and I think the, a good question about it, um, is, is are there some things that maybe potentiate her going in that crate that maybe make that crate more reinforcing to her? What about that... Um, you know, we don't know if, I, I, I don't remember if there was food in that crate or not, to be honest. I, I don't remember. Um, but I think even just looking at the space, um, yeah, do armadillos like to go into hidey places? Yeah, um, in my experience, they do tend to. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's a really good question to, um, to ask here. So I don't recall if this was the exact circumstances um, why they were loading her. It might have been to, um, might have been in the process of cleaning enclosures. I don't remember exactly the circumstances here, but I think you make a really good point. So, the the fact that at this particular moment the space was a little barren might have potentiated the um the the crate as a hiding sp space right so it might have made it more likely that she wanted to go in there because at this moment she didn't really have um a place to to um hide so that was a good a good observation when we think so it, it made it a little bit more reinforcing right because it was a good place to go hide so if we look at this other armadillo video um keep some of those thoughts in mind and this one i think I don't remember if I have the audio up. I do, so you can listen to her. Um, and this is normally when I would throw mealworms in there. I think I'm just going to give her another piece of banana. Yeah, that looked very smooth. Yeah. Um, Usually, when we do this behavior more often, she will automatically go into the stretcher in the correct position. And if you saw that, she was just like wandering all over the place, so which is why I used her target to get her into the correct position. Um, but yeah, when this behavior is 100%, that's what. So we'll watch it again and and would love to see your comments. So, and obviously we've lots of good stuff about this video, but I think it'd be fun to um, explore it with some of the things that we had in mind on our other, yeah, love the sling, really clear contingency of what happens when you enter the sling. Yeah. And so now we can think about um, some of the things you may recall from that other other slide. There's lots of things, lots of things going on here, right? So I think it's really cool to think about all the things that are going on here for our armadillo. What do you guys think? What are some things that you might have observed? Yeah, and I think they were inspired by, by our friends at Copenhagen Zoo with their guinea pig um, sling, who I think were in turn inspired by Living Desert. You know, all the, all the different people inspiring each other around the world, which is pretty cool. So what do you guys, what did you guys notice? What were some things that might be impacting this behavior? Um, maybe the magic carpet ride is fun and novelty. <laughs> you know, I, I love that you mentioned novelty. We really used that recently at um, our uh, recent consultation. Uh, it looks like the armadillo is being baited in the sling. Is this new or existing behavior for the armadillo? Uh, she did mention, I think, in her um, audio that um, 
that in the past the behavior had been a little bit more solid and that usually when she sees the sling she's right into it so I think she mentioned that maybe she had to use the target to get the animal in the sling um I, I to be honest I I don't uh hear the audio once I'm in in this then in the live stream I have to put my earpiece back in so um I'm just going off of memory here but um, but normally, uh, I think she said it's pretty solid. I think she might have had to backtrack a little bit there. But um, what are some other th what are, what are some other things that might you know we might notice about what contributes to to this behavior? What impacts this behavior potentially? If you think about some of the things that we were talking about earlier. That, and, and also things that I think are good to take note of um, when we talk about um, trying to, again, well, I, I, don't want, I don't want to put words in people's mouths. I'm trying to hold my tongue. <laughs> so what about this box? Anything in this box that um, you notice? That might be, uh, there, are, there are options for the armadillo in the tub too. Things like a wheel, hide, food, water, so the armadillo has other options available. Yes, thank you. I love that. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that, for me, I really noticed. You can see that she's got her, you know, and, and again, I don't know if you could see it very well, but she did have her food bowl in there. She still had some food left over in her bowl. Um, she still had places where she could um, hide if she wanted to. She's got other reinforcing options in her tub. And, um, and so the sling with its reinforcement history and again, you know, getting a little piece of banana for going in the sling, um, uh, you know, that, that tells us some stuff, right? So that, that really kind of makes this, um, you know, it, it, you know, she's got degrees of freedom as we would say, so to speak. And, and I think that's really cool. And, um, and then where it led to, what can we notice about the space that it led to that potentially could be impacting her participation? And, and that tub, um, I believe they do use for transport to go to, you know, education programs. The transport box also has smells and substrates, uh, substrate and may be pretty clear to the armadillo that this leads to other areas they like to explore. Sand, new substrate. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Another small hide type place. She feels secure in there. Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with all of you guys. I think that sand is a different substrate. I think it maybe has some interesting smells. I'm assuming that probably only she is transported in there um, just for, you know, proper disease control. So I imagine it smells like her. Um, and again, it's it's a you know a dark space once that lid is closed so it, it's kind of like another hidey place and again I know not everybody is you know familiar with um, you know the phylogeny of of uh, the species but but yeah so I, I suspect that there is reinforcing qualities of that space in addition to just the food reinforcers that she's getting there so when we think about that nonlinear contingency analysis there are other things besides just getting you know a piece of banana that make it reinforcing to be in that space so all those things i think are are important to consider all right let's look at another one okay um uh googling substrate because i don't know uh what that means ah now phylogeny shit. <laughs> Hey, well, that's what you're here for. You're here to learn about other animals, too. <laughs> Just the natural history of the species, right? You know, whenever we work with other animals, we want to think about, you know, what's important to them. So let's look at this, uh, this little box turtle. Okay, so I have the audio down. 
on this one. So I might have to do a little explanation here. So we've got some box turtles here and you can see the stations for these guys. And what the team um, here has done is they've taught them, similar to what you guys were describing, um, uh, that if you go to a station, that so those guys it will lead to reinforcement. Day? And uh, each, and millworms, yes. they, each turtle has their own station. But what I really sorry, love about it is right. that okay. going to your station can lead to other, other things. So in this case, it might mean more targeting. It might also mean that um, the box turtles may um they may get picked up because they do um they do pick them up but remember we were talking about like looking at body language and if a, if a turtle or tortoise is you know inside their shell then they may not take them on a program so these are the ones that i was referring to so if they tuck in tight in their shell then they kind of take that as a oh i don't know if they want to participate but they're also using the going to the station as sort of the first you know the first thing you know if you go to your station does that you know then that's going to lead to potentially some targeting behaviors it could lead to a ride in the in a in a kind of in a transport container that may also lead to going to um, um, a educational experience with guests and at the end of this video here you'll see um, a little training that they do in a stage where guests can watch that, and um, so it can lead to oh. lead to different things. So sorry. But but first, you have to train that behavior, like you guys were talking about. Okay, so they're building that reinforcement history. <laughs> oh, good. Soraya's giving you a definition here. Perfect. Phylogeny: behaviors and preferences that too. is innate oh, to the species, independent of how the animal was raised. Like cats love to sleep in small boxes, being a street cat or a house cat. Yeah, right? If if I fits, I sit. Is that is that the thing? <laughs> okay, and so here's our box turtle on one of them on stage. And so um, so one of the ways they might determine or they hope to determine if he wants to go do this on stage is if he might go to his red station first. And it might lead to transport towards to the stage to do this behavior or some other behaviors. There we go. All right, so we're back oh to the my. beginning there. Okay. Um, this is Poseidon, yeah. yes. He's Stark. And, and again, if you guys have any other comments to add to those things, you can. And, and, and I'll show, we'll look at some more videos here in a minute too. Um, and again, you know, it's kind of like what uh, Lindsay was saying well, and, but her example had several behaviors, right? So in this, this one, we've got, in this configuration, this is the, um, I think, number five. It emits a trained behavior, so going to a station, and it can lead to several different possible outcomes. <laughs> and Anne says, thank you. It was a phylogenist, a person who likes to, or a phylogenist or a person who likes to admire women. Oh, no, we're getting way off track. <laughs> okay. So I want to give you um, another example similar to the turtle. And I think uh, this one has audio. So I'm going to let you listen to the audio first, and then we can talk talk about it a little bit. Oh, okay. 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 Oh, they were bored. Uh, I picked him out Sorry, girl. from the I farm because they had baby. <laughs> <laughs> I raised him in a sister and the birth of him later. We are 1176. 1172. You said 1178. 1172. Oh, I lied. Okay. Yeah. So she gets a few pieces um, just since kind of we were, what, what we were talking about with like she seems to do better with a snack in the morning. Yeah. So that's just kind of incorporated into her weighing session. So she gets yeah. her one for coming to her yes perch, another one either for hanging out there. Oh, we're doing weird stuff today. <laughs> Lindsay says, oh, big girl, she is, yeah. 
So, uh, so you might have heard her say, come into her yes perch. So that perch in the front, they have designated as the perch that tells them if she wants to participate in a training session. And when she comes to that perch, you saw she gets, she gets something. But what happens next can really vary. So like you saw in this clip, they just did um, a session where they got a weight on her, but they don't do that every day. They might go in and do a session where um, she you know, is targeted to different perches. They might have her hop on their glove and they practice working with her in the hallway here. They might do a session where they practice um, putting um, threading jesses th through um, the, eye, the grommets on her anklets. Um, they do all sorts of different stuff with her, but it, it starts with her flying to that perch. And, um, and so, and what's different about, um, you know, like one of the things we talked about is that this species you know, they're not grazing all day, so they don't leave a bowl of food with her like they might do with a different species of animal. Um, so the way her diet is delivered is, like they said there, they give her, you know, they might give her a snack. They might do two training sessions a day with her. They might give her, you know, all of her diet during a training session. They might, if they, you know, don't do a training session, they might just give her the rest of her diet at the end of the day. Um, but uh but yeah so they and they're very very good at um and she's very good at giving body language um that and actually we used her as an example of how to how to read body language um and um and look at how interested in food an animal is based on behavior by how you know what using this owl so because so, what she will do is when she's starting to satiate, she really starts wiping her beak and she flies up to the perch way in the top corner and she just sits up there and she starts to close her eyes. Um, so, but yeah, but that perch is really sort of her, her uh, yes perch. How is, how is this owl opting in? Isn't this just a chain behavior? It's not a chain behavior because the, um, that going to that first perch can lead to many, 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 many different things. It doesn't just lead to the um, lead to the scale. It can lead to many other behaviors. It just it just starts with the that perch, and then it can go in many different directions. So they may ask her to hop to the glove. They may start working her in the hallway. They may start asking her to go to different perches. So there is no specific chain. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting, and what's really cool is this bird. Um, when we first met her, she would have nothing to do with people, <laughs> so she's really come a long way. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's not a specific sequence or a um, specific chain, to be honest. There is there is no specific sequence ever. So she never knows what's going to happen after she goes to that first perch. Um, it's it's pretty much different every single time so uh okay so let's look at another one so so this is nice to see that he's actually very yeah, he's very responsive yeah, he's very go responsive. ahead and this is what we want from the wallabies yeah <laughs> <laughs> you got it let go there you go um and I still have, like, I'm still doing research on them to try to attempt to figure out, you know, what's, uh, what some behaviors that they can do. Like, I didn't know that their tail, what, they weren't able to hang from their tail, so it was nice to kind of, like, um, Joe is, Joe and Chelsea are his secondaries with me. Okay. Um, so we've been kind of talking about, um, eventually to, admit, to hope to get him out for maybe, like, pro, um, for, for shows and programs. Um. They're not typically very good on handling, but I'd like to make him, since he's still kind of, he's about, he's about four years old, I'd like to make him um, definitely a program animal. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not for touching, but just yep. get him comfortable like coming out for programs, because I think he's he's a cool animal. He's also on the, he's on the IU, IUCN list, mm -hmm. so I'd like to, um, I, feel, I feel like he's a good, he's a good conservation message to talk yeah. about. So um, 
So one facility I work with, they have one that is really, really in, seems to enjoy coming out, kind of gets mm -hmm. stimulated by seeing, you know, the new environments and um, spaces and whatnot. And he will climb up, you know, on the keeper just because, you know, and so sort of the arm kind of is like an extension of, of the perch. But I think one thing you could do with him that would make it sort of more versatile so that he could go on a lot of people is you could make like a, a tea perch that's made out of natural branches, kind of like the one that they're, they did with... Um, with Lilo. Yeah, with Lilo. And um, that could be something that you, since he's responding really well to you just even presenting food like that, mm -hmm. you could start teaching him that, you know, if you held up like this setup right now, for example, it could be that you hold a tea perch that becomes like an extension of this and you lure him out onto the tea perch and then you lure him back in. And so it's similar to like the crating behavior with the wallabies that you build up that reinforcement history of coming up onto the tea perch, going back out, coming back on, going back out. And then eventually you'd start moving that tea perch a little bit. And then maybe that leads to other reinforcing experiences, yeah. not just the food, but maybe it's like seeing new environments. If he likes that, you know, you'd have to evaluate that to see if he thinks that's interesting or not. That's sort of your thing, like you're saying about testing, do you want to go out on a program or not? Yeah. And so eventually it could lead to that, you know, getting onto the tea perch is your, okay, I'm interested in coming out. Obviously you could still reinforce it with food, but it also... Um, become sort of like this is your this is your station so to speak right um, and you're self-loading and maybe that tea perch has a platform on it so that you can place it into a container that gets transported to the show area or wherever he's going to be to participate mm -hmm. so, so um, I didn't really set it up because I just wanted you to hear what they were saying or what we were saying but that particular skink is is in quarantine, so that's why he's in a smaller space at the moment. And um, and we were just, you know, getting to know him at the end of the day, and that and that um, person was just getting started with him. And and you heard us discussing about, you know, some possible options. And um, and so I was just talking about, you know, like a a tea perch that could be the extension there and start building that reinforcement history with something that could be. Um, the thing that he learns to go to, and um, and uh, yeah, I love the idea of testing if he would like to be a part of the program instead of just using him. Uh, yeah, and that's really where they're going to with all their animals. There is uh, is that they want all their animals to be able to have the option to say to to have a way, you know, kind of like what um, Lindsay was talking about with with the skunk is getting to a place where they've got all these different ways of saying I you know what do I want to do today you know what do I want to do today and the cool thing with the tea perch that he talked about um, you know I was saying how it could have like a platform on it but they also have a cart that has apparently has like a hollow stump on it and they could place the tea perch in the stump so so they really essentially never have to pick up the animal to get it you know to to you know bring it on a program and basically the animal once it has reinforcement history with that it could learn that oh well there is there is an option for me to walk onto that if I want to but the key part goes back to these critical consequences right you know if we're making it so that you know this is the only way he can get access to um, a certain critical consequence then that makes that coercive but I think one of the things you noticed is that he had a big giant bowl of food right there so hopefully we're not making that coercive by um, by offering that. But the and the other thing is that you know could it lead to other potentially reinforcing um, consequences? Are there other contingencies that we can provide that make this so that it's it's um, fun to participate? But we also have to teach that, right? You know, it doesn't just automatically happen. And so that was you know some of the other things that Lindsay was mentioning. And so. Um, so I was going to give you another, you know, you heard me talking to him saying that, you know, another place I worked with had um, a, 
a prehensile-tailed skink that really seem to like exploring new environments. And so can we create that experience? I mean, and, and the reality is, you know, if an animal's living in a, this space, you know, it's hard, the way to, you know, we can't just provide a new environment. We kind of have to bring it to those new environments. And so um, I will show you uh, this guy. This is the one that I was talking about. And I might turn down the volume and I can just talk over it because we're starting to use up all our time here already. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, the harness thing they, they did at this particular um, facility, I don't know if they continued with the harnessing. Um, you know, you'll see that he never really attached it to anything. And they didn't use food as a reinforcer, as you'll see. Um, you know, this animal seemed to learn the the um you know as you saw it climbed out on its own voluntarily they didn't they never reached in and grabbed it um it was basically present the arm and if the animal climbed out it climbed out you know that that was that was their indicator that it's good to go um and as he's talking about here um the animal does prefer to go up and so they can use that as a as a, a means to gain that kind of movement as well um and so just raising your arm up seemed to generate that kind of movement. But, you know, they would, they would, sometimes this guy would come to meetings we would have, you know, it's, if he, you know, again, it was, he had the option to, and, um, you know, if an arm was presented and he started moving towards it, he had that option to come out and participate. And you're going to see as we watch this video and what he's talking about here, um, I could turn the audio up. is how he, he likes looking at the plants and going towards the plants. When I walk him back, he tries to reach out and grab it. He's definitely more exploratory than the other ones are. It's like it smells like food. <laughs> <laughs> it smells like something. It's definitely enriching. But as you can see, he would engage with his environment, and so that kind of gave us information that it certainly seemed these these trips outside of his his habitat seem to have some value for him and it would not surprise me if he made the connection that that leaving the enclosure led to some interesting explorations so and it says reminds me of our lemurs they like to get the option of getting access to the back area explore shelves buckets etc yeah yeah I, I mean i you know i think sometimes we underestimate <laughs> these guys and speaking of underestimating um uh i know i've showed you this toad before but i, I got to see him again this time um and just a a few quick targeting sessions here or reps here but i'll tell you what's gonna where we're going with this Nice. So I'll let you watch them without the sound and I'll tell you, you know, what we discussed. So, um, you know, in general, people, although they're very good about, you know, all sorts of, um, you know, hand washing and protective gloves and um, special water that they use with these guys, um, you know, they would love for it to be the option where the toads load themselves into containers. Um, and so, you know that means teaching them how to do that now these these animals don't as you can see they're you know the movements that they do are not you know big movements and we found even with the targeting you know that that he doesn't do a lot of movement and so we we are we kind of brainstormed a strategy um and a setup that i think 
we can potentially get this guy to load himself into um, a container. And so hopefully down the road they'll have they'll have that uh, that that trained, and um, and we'll let you know <laughs> on that. Um, now the next one I want to show you is this uh, the short-tailed opossum. And so as you can see here with this this piece of wood, um, what what they um, worked on was teaching him that this wood is the thing that means elevator ride to and from your enclosure. And you'll also see he's got a place to hide. And then obviously, if he wants, and then because um, these guys do like to be in little nests and, and hollows. Um, and then he also has a trained behavior of targeting. Um, and it, and if he wants, at any time, he can go back onto that, that piece of wood for an elevator ride back into his enclosure. Um, and although, and, and that time he was trying to target him back up there to bring him back home. But, uh, um, but the, the mealworm fell. And I think what's uh, um, really cool about this setup is... Um, Mary Hunter did something similar, I think. I love this one. Well, this is the thing we were talking about that was at ABAI or similar to what was at ABAI. Um, yeah, so this is the short-tailed short -tailed opossum. And this is an old guy, just so you know. This is why he's missing a little hair around his butt. He's just getting old. <laughs> So this was the thing that was at the, um, similar to a poster that was at the ABAI conference that one of the students at UNT did that I was trying to explain, but I didn't explain very well, is a student um, had a setup with her rat where she had four different options on the table. There was a, a brick, um, a little plastic critter carrier, a tube, uh, a PVC tube, and a circle, like a you know, kind of like a, um, a, t a station. And the rat knew that it could go to the station and get food. It could hide in the tube if it wanted to. It could go in the critter carrier and get lifted back into its habitat. It could, it could stand on the brick and get picked up and held by its owner. Um, and, um, and so it could allocate behavior to any of those four locations if it wanted to. And sh basically her research project compared where the animal allocated behavior if it had access to food um, all the time versus if food was restricted. And, and so remember, it always got food on the station. So if, if um, food was freely available, the rat would um, go to the station and take food, but then it would go eat it inside the PVC tube. So it seemed to prefer to eat that food in a place where it could hide. But if food was restricted, it would tend to stay on the um, station and eat food on the station and basically wait for more food on the station. So basically, the, the gist of the study was to show that you could influence behavior by withholding critical consequences, by withholding food. So you could make positive reinforcement coercive. And so that was the point of it. So... Um, I had a conversation with the person working with this animal to find out if um, food was withheld with this guy. And this guy has access to his diet before training sessions. Um, now, granted, though, you know, as you can see, the worms are very special. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, but he does get some worms in his diet. Um, so there's a couple bigger worms here that are that he doesn't normally get, but he, the smaller worms he does get in his diet. Um, but he acts, has access to insectivore and fruit um, in his diet um, before training sessions. And and the keeper, you know, he doesn't he doesn't train at a specific time every day. It may change um, when he might train the animal. Usually it's late morning. Um, but it 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 uh um, but yeah, but but I think it's really cool that what it says to you is the fact that you know. The fact that the animal is willing to target um, and is not seeking to go back home, is not looking to hide, says some good things about the training, right? So that it's not it's not necessarily coercive. Um, so some comments, um, yeah, that's the one <laughs> that Gus is saying about um, the study. Um, and that was with, from Hannah McGee, by the way. I have seen this with a western spotted skunk I work with. Interesting detail observed. Same thing. If she's less hungry, she will often want to take the food to a safe covered um, spot. If she's more hungry, then she will stay out to eat. Yeah. 
Um, the other thing that I think you guys might find really, really fascinating is, and I love that this team um, did this. So we've talked a lot about scent reinforcers um, with the animals in this collection. And so they've gotten really creative with that. And I don't know if you can see the bottle um, with the yellow sprayer on the top there, or outside of his enclosure. So they made a solution that is scented with his urine. And the reason they have that is because if he um, is ever uncomfortable out there, they've noticed that he's more likely to scent mark that table. Um, and so in the past they have sprayed the table with his urine and that makes him more comfortable out there. So again, when we talk about non-contingency analysis, um, and that just increases his, his comfort level to have it smell more like him. So I think that is super cool. Yeah, Lindsay says smart. And, um, and so they have a really cool, um, to mark his te territory beforehand. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it makes him more comfortable. And so the way that they've come up with, and we've, we've yeah, cool idea. And the way that they've um, created safe scents there, because we've used scent reinforcers of, a uh, sense of other animals as reinforcers for other species there. Um, the way that they came up with it is they will take like bedding and they will soak it in water and then they will put it in the freezer to kill any um, bad things and uh, and then they save it. Yep. And uh, and Soraya says she does this with rodents and cats and rabbits. Yeah. So um, so so it's pretty cool. All right. So and just to kind of like give you I know you guys have seen this before and I'm going to turn down the audio. But you remember this pigeon video, but again, this is sort of um, along those lines, you know, if you think about these pigeons, they can get food from Paul here. And, you know, I show up one day with some goodies and pigeons learn that they can get goodies for doing behaviors with me. And keep in mind that pigeons can certainly fly away if they want to. And pigeons certainly have other places where they've learned that they can get goodies. So here, you know, here we have pigeons that can get you know, critical consequences in many different places, but they may learn that um, that there's all these different options to um, to to allocate their behavior. And one of the things that you'll even see in the video is you'll see this one right here, this dark one. He would chase others away. So you know the the contingencies for some to participate is you know they're less likely to participate because one guy's a bully. <laughs> So, and you'll see it right here. He just, he just chased that pigeon away because he's like, nope, it's, it's all mine. I'm the one who gets all the food here. It's easier for me. You guys go over there. And so they're more likely to get their food from Paul. So yeah, so um, things to think about. Um, and look at that. We're already at, at the top of the hour practically. So, um, so I know those were, you know, a lot of different configurations, but I wanted to share those because um, I think we're really kind of, again, we're, we're, you know, we've made a lot of strides towards making it so that animals that are, are you know, participating things are, are maybe having ways to say, yeah, I want to. Um, but we're also kind of trying to keep moving along that pathway, right? I actually watched, um, and I watched a, a pretty cool example with some dogs that were in a therapy program. And I will share that link in the education program. I think one of the cool things they did was they had a, so they had their, their people that were the participants that were sitting in chairs and they had a chair with a towel on it in between the participants. They had a mat in front of the participants and then they had another mat in between that and then they had the dog and the dog had a bed and, the, and it also had a water bowl next to the bed. And so the dog had the option to sit in its own bed. It could go to the mat in the middle, which was the, if you go to this mat, we're gonna offer you um, two two activities so to speak so you could and so they would offer it two different toys basically and the dog could choose which toy it wanted by putting a paw on whichever one it wanted so they basically had to train that behavior you know pick pick an object and then that object would be offered to the guests sitting in the chair and so like if it was throw um, bean bags was one of them the guests could throw the bean bag for the dog which this particular dog really liked doing that um, 
And then another one was like a puzzle feeder. And so the guests could put treats in the puzzle feeder and give it to the dog and the dog would do the puzzle feeder. Um, and then in front of the guests was another mat and the dog could go to the mat and then hop up on the chair for um, tactile, for touch. And, and then they would let the, the guests touch the dog and, if the do and then they would have them stop. And if the dog leaned into the guest, then they could touch the dog more and then they would have them stop. And if the dog, you know, laid down and wanted, you know, look, gave body language that says wanted more, they could touch more. But if the dog got up and walked away and went to its bed, then it was done. So it was, it was a really nice setup of ways for, to check in with the dog to basically say, what do you want to do? Do you want to play this game? Do you want to play that game? Do you want touch? Do you not want touch? Or do you want to just not do this anymore and go lay down in your bed? So it's really cool to, to see that, you know, we're taking it, people are taking it to the next level. And it looks like, you know, we've got some things in place already in our communities and, and we're looking at more ways to take it to the next level. So I really like that. Yeah, Soraya, very, very cool dog example. So I'll put the link to that video in the education program because it was from a webinar that's online and so not something that I own per se to share or have permission to share but I can certainly give the link to you guys so that you can go watch it on your own um, and I'll, I'll give you the timestamp where that video is so you can check it out um, but just to kind of recap here training in color yeah um, so again you know kind of the choice and control words which are you know again a little fuzzy are hot topics in the animal training community and I think you know we've as animal care professionals have been making strides towards making participation more voluntary especially for animals in involved in educational programming some of the steps taken towards this include creating opportunities for animals to load themselves in transport containers as opposed to picking them up or teaching animals to go to specific locations prior to requesting other behaviors, or using animals going to specific stations as indicators, it is okay to be handled for transport. This in combination with observing body language has been very helpful for us. Um, and as caregivers move towards the next steps in maximizing behavioral freedom, this means adding on some more behavior options, right? So this can include teaching multiple options that result in reinforcing consequences. And once learned, the animal has the option to demonstrate where it would like to allocate behavior among several options. Then the conditions um, will be important to uh, the conditions will be important to evaluate when the question "What to do?" or "What do you want to do?" is asked. Uh, this is to ensure that behavior allocation is not biased towards a specific option right so and that can happen like we talked about with the with the rat example from um, Hannah's paper um, due to limited accessibility to things like critical consequences or the discovery that some behaviors are harder to do maybe or maybe they're being punished by you know another animal competing for the, um, the you know the same thing all that kind of stuff so very you know it's like I said we're just kind of beginning these conversations I think we're we're um, moving in really good directions we've already started that and I and it's just going to be fun to see where everybody can go with this stuff it's going to be been going to be really cool to see all these animals going mm, I want to do that or I want to do that or no nah, I don't want to do that you know we're just going to keep coming up with creative ways so 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 what I shared with you today are just you know kind of food for thought things right we're just we're we're just kind of exploring um all the directions we can go let's see um uh, one of my mini horses also always sniffs my feet shoes don't usually think of horses and scent work but I know they do um, Peggy Hogan I know has done some the urine scent with a horse seems a lot <laughs> yes no kidding I mean I think that's how I captured a Fleming response was by letting a little mini um, into a stall where a female had just been um, for this I always use the same shoes to keep um, more of the same scent ah yes uh, of course because it could be so distracting right uh, and Anne w wants to hear um, more uh, from Soraya about all these things here and how she's using scent. Yeah, I think scent is uh, one of those ones that's underrated. And I, and I should explain the way it kind of started for us was, um, and I didn't put a video of him in here, but he's just, he's really doing so well. They have a monitor lizard named Matt who has a really sad story. It was kind of like, you know, a, a dumped monitor lizard found, you know, found you know in in an urban area that you know shouldn't belong there and so um you know didn't you know wasn't didn't really like people or anything because uh you know it just wasn't being 
cared for. And so the zoo took him in, you know, given him a, a lot of um, improvements and, you know, better life and everything. And now he's like, he's such a rock star but at first you know he wasn't really responding to much in the way of um you know appetitives and so we were searching for maybe scent as a reinforcer and he and they found he really responded to the smell of the virginia opossum and so they were they soaked her um her bed linens and uh and use that from a spray bottle as the reinforcer um but now he's you know he's like such a rock star and it unfortunately they're um it's just so hot in Memphis right now. They can't use them on the stage, but, but yeah. So I, I just think scent is so underrated sometimes as the as such a great reinforcer. Um, I did want to mention for those of you that are members of Animal Training Fundamentals, you know, we have that that um, that great uh, live stream on assent versus consent versus consent. So what's the difference in all those? And also. Um, the presentation I did at the Association for Be Behavior Analysis uh, International, I recorded it, and it's in the education program. So uh, you'll see it on the dashboard. I have it as the featured um, presentation. So go check it out. And if you really like this topic about degrees of freedom, which is a lot of what we're talking about here and, you know, different ways to get assent um, using degrees of, and why degrees of freedom is important and critical consequences. Um, Sean, Will, and Masanisha Muta are going to talk about that for um, our next uh, global online animal training series. And we finally nailed down a date. It's going to be September 5th. So be sure to add it to your calendar. I haven't um, set up the registration yet, but, um, and those of you that are members, just, you know, send me a note if you're not already on the, you know, the, the list of I want to attend all of them and I'll make sure you're on there. And speaking of uh, Sean and Masa, who are from the Constructional Approach to Animal Welfare and Training, they are hosting a conference coming up soon next month, and I will be speaking on training herds, um, herds of animals, and how I've used um, the constructional approach, um, focusing on the negative reinforcement contingency for those animals that want distance as a reinforcer with uh, those those flighty herds of animals. And, oh my gosh, new announcement. I am speaking at the um, Ethics in Professional Practice Conference in Beverly, Massachusetts at Endicott College. So it is going to be um, in person, but they also have a virtual option. So it's a hybrid event. And... Um, and I'm really excited that um, also Jill Lang and Paul Andronis are there. So this is really going to be an awesome opportunity for, for those of you that know these speakers. You can never get enough of them, I'm telling you. So if you go to behavior.org, and um, it's really it's right there on their homepage. So you're going to see an opportunity to click on the link. And their registration is open now. So check that one out. And you may have noticed that I've started adding some blogs to AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com. Uh, so a couple blog, well, more than a couple blogs are already up. <laughs> and if you're not a member, well, gosh, what are you waiting for? We got so many great membership options and so many resources in there. It's it's crazy. And the website's had a tune-up um, from my my good buddy, my web web designer, who is fantastic, who's down in South America and does just such great work. All right, look at that. We're just a little bit over, but hopefully you enjoyed talking about this subject. Um, always so much fun when I get to go out and visit with folks, and I'll be visiting some more folks soon. But I'm here next week, so uh, so we'll do another one next week and chat some more. And I feel like I talked a lot this time, but we got to watch lots of videos. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Soraya. It's good to see you again. And Anne and Chris and Annetta and Gus and all our regulars. There's there's it's been it feels like it's been a while. <laughs> and Lindsay, yes. And Patricia. Oh my gosh. So many good people here. All right, guys. Well, we went a little over, but um, hopefully it was fun. And I uh, is there a tower talk tomorrow? Oh, it's not tomorrow. I think it's next week. I, I at least according to my calendar. I hope that's right. I'm pretty sure it's next week. Yeah. I, um, oh, oh, well, that's very sweet of you guys. I, I was listening to you all this morning on the recording for um, the lab for um, for Cout <laughs> before I joined this. 
Uh, and Annette says, thank you for another great Monday. And all right, cool. All right, guys. Well, I guess that, that does it this time. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you uh, next week. And we'll do a Tower Talk next week, too. All right. I think that does it. Ha all right. Good deal. I'm going to sign off and we'll see you all next time. Take care.